Is it the view of the president's communications team that he is equally adept in all settings in terms of communications, or are there some that played a greater strength, some where he probably isn't as strong? In Maricopa County in Arizona, we helped build a new bridge over the, uh, over the, over the Holly River. Look, in, in Warsaw, or excuse me, Washoe County in Nevada. I will tell you this, the president is the best communicator that we have in the White House. <laughs> Merch.com. Use the promo code Stu10 and save 10%. If you are watching on YouTube, like the video right now, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, do all the things. We appreciate it. Glenn Beck is going to join us here in a little bit to talk about the start of the next Cold War. What a fun time that will be. Diane Feinstein is at least making her last term an entertaining one. But we start by doing the war on children's minds. You know, I don't know, a couple decades ago, we made a little bit of a decision decided to try a major mass experiment on our children. And that's always a fun thing to do. When has everything, you know, when has anything ever gone wrong when you try that? I will tell you, as a person who's been in media for longer than two decades now, um, I have met a lot of people who work in media and over that time have really done a, a, a large sort of study on who they are and, and how they act. And I've realized that almost all of them are completely insane. They're almost all completely insane. And I will say, going through multiple years in media, you kind of get to the point where you think, well, crazy people are attracted to this business, right? Radio, TV, you know, you just get a lot of people who are kind of nutty and they might have great ideas, but they're probably quirky in their personal lives and maybe a little eccentric and maybe that's what makes them funny or entertaining or engaging. And they bring themselves into this business because it's, how, it's what they're attracted to do. And I've sort of had a change of heart in that observation over the years. They're all still completely insane. But I think it's the media that might bring them there. It's like a chicken and egg situation. When you get into this business, and this business basically is kind of trying to say things that are going to wrestle attention away from average people who are sitting back on their phones or uh, back in the day on their radios and try to make yourself stand out and say things in an interesting way and think about things in a different way. And, it, and while it might work for those purposes, it also makes you completely nuts. Then came social media and we tried this whole experiment. We're like, you know, what if, what if we just put everyone in that business at once? What if... Everyone was trying to say something salty or entertaining or engaging and post pictures and come up with content all the time. Except with this experiment, we're just not going to pay any of them. In fact, they're probably going to wind up paying us uh, with uh, clicking on ads, but we're just not going to give them a cent. And they're all going to have to do all the crazy stuff that people in the radio and TV business used to be. And they'll all turn insane, too. And that's been the last 20 years or so. A wild, wild experiment. And we're seeing now the results of this experiment because as we go back 20 years, uh, social media starts, it grows and grows and grows, eventually grasps uh, our, our kids that turn into teenagers and turn into a more depressed generation than we've seen in quite a long time. And really, it's been more since the iPhone came out. We're talking about basically a decade, a little bit over. These numbers have risen like crazy, really negative characteristics that we try to discourage and we try to avoid for our kids are just rising through the roof over and over and over and over again. A new uh, study came out from the CDC and these numbers are really, really shocking. Uh, persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness among U.S. high school students. This is by sex. And what you see is um, among boys uh, in 2011, about 21 percent said they felt persistently sad or hopeless. That number stayed flat till about 2017. It rose up to 27% before the pandemic and is now at 29% after the pandemic. Or I guess this is 2021, so sort of still mid-pandemic. We don't have any more updated numbers than that. The same thing 
uh, happens among girls, but it's much more dramatic. Started at about 36% persistent sadness back in 2011. This is the iPhone era. Then up to 39, up to 40, up to 41, up to 47. And in 2021, the number hit 57%. These are not the signs of a healthy society. Now, some of that is driven by the pandemic, though you saw the numbers were rising significantly before the pandemic even occurred. How about seriously considering suicide? Boys pretty much flat, around 13 to 14 percent. But girls, 19 percent in 2011, 2013, 22 percent, 2015, 23 percent, bounces back down to 22, but then up to 24 percent in 2019, and then 2021, 30 percent, 30 percent of girls considered suicide. This is bonkers. Now, you might say, okay, well, what does that really mean? You get a little bit of a sense of this when you say, hey, did you attempt suicide? What you see here is a similar story in some ways, but also more muted. Uh, Girls went from 10 to 13 percent, boys just 6 to 7 percent. The good news about that number is you could kind of get to the point where you look at some of the earlier numbers where you say, oh, am I constantly depressed? Am I I going to attempt uh, suicide? Am I considering it? Those numbers are skyrocketing where the actual attempts are not skyrocketing, indicating that some of this is performative, right? Like we have this idea that as a society, we've just said, hey, you know what's really great is being a victim. You know what's really great is, is the world coming down on you. You, have, you feel hopeless. You feel sad. In a way, that's sort of been praised. It's been turned into a currency of sorts. And you see teenage girls and teenage boys at some level embracing this sort of social pressures that would indicate that saying you're sad or hopeless or I want to commit suicide actually makes you feel good about yourself in a way. It draws the attention you're craving. And while some of it is incredibly serious, the fact that the actual attempts are not going up all that much is really probably a positive sign when it comes to actually protecting teenagers' lives. Unfortunately, too many people still go down this road. We hope, uh, of course, that that doesn't uh, continue. But there is that situation where social media is, is creating all sorts of new incentives. Incentives to be entertaining, to be engaging. What's the most dramatic? No one makes a movie about a person who's slightly sad. People make movies about people who are incredibly sad, who are committing suicide, who are on the verge of suicide. Just a mild day in your life is not going to make a movie. And when you're just talking about movies, well, that's fine, right? Like you see seven or eight movies a year and the fact that they're at the extremes of emotion plays into it. Like the best songs come from extreme emotion. But you notice that the artists who make them are often insane. They've driven themselves insane by embracing constant pressures to be more and more emotive. That's what social media presses into reality. This, it, it, it creates this constant perpetual motion machine where we're always chasing more likes and more. And when you say more likes, what that means is you're trying to evoke more emotion. You're trying to pull more emotion out of people. You're trying to show either your life is so incredibly wonderful or your life is so incredibly terrible. And when you do that across a society, you get results like this. And we're still at the beginning of it. We haven't actually gone through the thought process to map this out at all. And it's apparent in almost everything that we see. And it's also really troubling when you talk about the way society is dealing with it. Yes, a lot of people will tell you, oh, well, the, su- the teen suicide trend is really, really bad and we should try to stop it. Crazy thing, eating tie po- Tide Pods, right? When that was a thing, people were like, hey, this is a really bad thing. We should try to stop it. But that's not always the case. Let me give you another one. This is going back to 2021. And this is another example of when I think these things become performative. You have this sort of social contagion that leads to an increase in in a sort of bizarre behavior. And we had this in 2021. Wall Street Journal wrote a story about it at the time. Teen girls are developing tics. Doctors say TikTok could be a factor. Here's what they say. Teenage girls across the globe have been showing up at doctor's offices with tics, physical jerking movements and verbal outbursts since the start of the pandemic. According to a spate of recent medical journal articles, doctors say the girls had been watching videos of TikTok influencers who said they had Tourette's syndrome, a nervous system disorder that causes many people to make repetitive involuntary movements 
or sounds. Now, it's a serious thing. When people have it, it can be a real problem. Uh, but the fact that you're watching TikTok and watching other people have these symptoms, why would that affect someone who's watching it? Well, this is the social contagion we're talking about. Since March 2020, Texas Children's Hospital has reported seeing approximately 60 teens with such ticks, whereas doctors saw only one or two cases a year before the pandemic. At Johns Hopkins University Tourette Center, uh, Center 10 to 20 percent of pediatric pa patients have described acute onset tick-like behaviors up from just 2 or 3 percent a year before the pandemic. Between March and June of half a year, at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, said it saw 20 patients with these ticks up from 10 from the full year before. So we're talking four, five, six, 20 times as many people with the same thing. Obviously, unless there's some new chemical that's causing this out there in the environment, this is something that's coming from what we saw on social media at the time. This was a big trend at the beginning of the pandemic. People watched these things. They became fascinated with it. They watched it all the time. And all of a sudden, they found that they had these same ticks. So how did society deal with that problem? They said they tried to treat the kids. They tried to say, hey, this isn't real. Hey, you're watching too much TikTok. Stop doing that. They said, hey, this isn't actually Tourette's syndrome you're dealing with right here. We're going to help treat you to get you better. And did it work? Well, we have this now from the New York Times. How teens recovered from the TikTok ticks. Similar outbreaks have happened for centuries. Mysterious symptoms can spread rapidly in a close-knit community, especially ones that have endured a shared stress. The TikTok ticks are one of the largest modern examples of this phenomenon. They arrived at a unique moment in history when a once-in-a-century pandemic spurred pervasive anxiety and isolation, and social media was at times the only way to uh, connect and commiserate. Perhaps as striking as the wave of TikTok ticks, is how quickly it has receded. As teenagers have resumed their pre-pandemic social lives, new cases of the ticks have petered out, and doctors said most of their tick patients now have recovered, illustrating the expansive potential for adolescent resilience. That's not what, that's not what it illustrates at all. It's not, it's not like they were like so strong they overcame the ticks. They never had the ticks in the first place. They never had Tourette's. They didn't recover from Tourette's. They started going out and seeing people again instead of being on TikTok 24 hours a day, which I might remind you, it comes directly from the Chinese Communist Party. And they somehow were able to overcome Tourette's syndrome because they never had Tourette's syndrome. And we didn't encourage their Tourette's syndrome. We didn't say, you know what's wonderful about you? Your Tourette's syndrome. And we must embrace your Tourette's syndrome. That was a delusion. They didn't actually have it. So we tried to discourage it so their life wasn't lived in a constant state of torture. Which brings me to the issue of gender and how our approach as a society has been the complete opposite. We have decided instead when a boy believes they're a girl, many times the same exact situation as the TikTok ticks had been playing out. They were watching a lot of media. Their friends might be doing it. Social contagion, which is something that is well known among med medical professors. This is not some new idea. And it winds up changing people. They wind up thinking they're girls. They wind up happy, experimenting with different sexualities and genders and all these things. And instead of saying, hey, you know, maybe get off TikTok for a few minutes. Hey, maybe get off Instagram for a few minutes. Maybe consider that, that you're not a girl. Maybe you're not. Instead of saying that and actually dealing with these things and these feelings, which are, in many cases, a real delusionary thought, instead of dealing with them the same way we dealt with the TikTok ticks, we instead encourage it and say, we affirm these beliefs. We say, yes, you are a girl. Yes, you are this thing you think you are that you just created because your friends are doing it. Yes, of course, we should take it seriously. Yes, of course, we should help you do these things. We should help these transitions occur. And the fact that we treat it this way is going to make it play out in a very different way than the TikTok ticks. Will it go away? Will it? When these medical institutions, when the elites in our society are saying things to encourage this behavior, when they're not saying, hey, maybe take a, take a, a pill uh, that will give you a, a sense of reality, and I mean a literal pill, but I mean like kind of like the red pill where you're gonna have a, a sense of reality, we're just saying, no, stay in your delusionary state. 
Whatever you believe about yourself, do you think you're a bird? Do you think, do you think you're a duck? Are you a mallard today? Well, you certainly don't look like a mallard, but we're going to affirm your mallardness. Instead of doing that, we're doing something totally different. So how does this play out? Because there's a really important competition going on. I hate to tell you, you know, there's this idea that maybe we'll come to this like we did with the TikTok ticks. We'll treat it with sanity and we'll get past it and it'll be over. Or it can go another direction. Story from uh, Breitbart. Poll from America's most prestigious private school gives a glimpse into our future elite. It also uh, apparently offers dental implants in just 24 hours. So there you go. In case you want them, you can now get them if you go to that story. However, they, they go through this poll and it's really fascinating because it's not a poll about you and me. It's not a poll about average people. It's not a poll about uh, average people in average schools. We're talking about people at the most elite institutions. I believe it's Harvard, right? Or is it all Ivy League? I can't remember. I read the story a little earlier. But they, they asked them the questions that are very interesting, basic about people. And they asked them uh, in, in a kind of interesting way. When you think about what is the percentage of people who are gay and how many per percentage of people are straight, you kind of have an idea that there's a small percentage of people who are gay or bisexual and then a much larger that, that are straight. It's not really the way we, what, we, what we're seeing right now in elite schools. Let me look, show you this graph. For men, 86% are heterosexual, 4% are homosexual, and then you have other things like 1.2% pansexual, 0.9% queer, 2.4% questioning, 1.4% asexual, 7.5% bisexual, and 0.7% demisexual. Add all of those up, you're at 14%, you know, let's call it alternative lifestyles, as they used to say. Um, that might, I mean, that's still really high, right? 14%. Much higher than I think we would have thought at any point in recent history. These numbers are, are skyrocketing right now. But when you look at, when you're talking about Ivy League institutions, the people who become the leaders, probably when it comes to academics, for sure, probably politics and many other big professions, uh, uh, law, uh, medical professionals, that's a much different percentage. Now look at women. Only 60% say they're heterosexual. 3.1% uh, homosexual. 3.5% pansexual, 9.4% queer, 11.1% unsure, 2.2% asexual, 24.2% bisexual. Again, this is a totally different profile than the rest of America. And that these are the people that are gonna be in these high level institutions. Political inf affiliations, a similar story. Uh, only with, while 36.2% are liberal, only 9.8% are conservative, and we often will compare uh, liberal to conservative, but that's not the way to do this. Conservative and socialist are almost identical in the percentage when we're talking about our elites. 9.8% conservative, 7.7% liberal. Or excuse me, uh, socialist, oh my gosh. This is a race between the elite left and sanity. It's going on right now in front of our eyes. Whoever wins that race will define our entire culture for the next generation and beyond. Who does America? Ah, one of the best days of the month is when our box of awesome from Bespoke Post arrives. Now, I uh, I have the tra one of them the travel uh, box that they give you. Look at this. This is a cool uh, travel bag that I got recently. Uh, really nice quality. I mean, I can't even, it's hard to describe, but it's like, you've got these nice like rivets and it's like, this is a solid high quality bag. Got the cool labels inside. It's got a nice strap. You can change the size of it. You can go through the whole thing. Got the nice uh, patches and stuff on it. A great bag to take on any travel trip for the gym or whatever you want. And this thing, uh, it's just one of the items I got from uh, my box of awesome. They're sending great stuff like that all the time. It's a brand I had, didn't, didn't even know existed, honestly. But I didn't even know they had stuff like that. It's a really, really nice bag. And it comes in your box of awesome. It's just one of the things. Now, when you do this, you go take a quiz at boxofawesome.com. I came out with the travel. Uh, you know, I got to do a, a decent amount of traveling. So I like having things, that, you know, like a bag I can just throw over my shoulder and go on the plane, make it really, really easy. Put your laptop in it, put your clothes in it, put your gym stuff, whatever you want. Uh, they release new boxes every month across a ton of different categories. And each box is, is valued at like around $70. But I can tell you right now, just buying that one thing, it's going to be more than $70. Uh, it's a high quality item. 
They're doing this all the time because they're working with these small businesses that you know you probably have never heard of. 90% of everything that comes in your box of awesome is from a small up and coming brand. It's free to sign up and you can skip a month or cancel anytime. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com. Enter the code STU at checkout. It's boxofawesome.com. Code is STU. 20% off your first box. Boxofawesome.com. Code STU. I'm joined now by Glenn Beck. His newest special coming up right after this program, 8 p.m. or excuse me, 9 p.m. Eastern tonight. It is yes, we're in a cold war with China. The playbook to take down the U.S. Exposed. Make sure to stay tuned and check that out. I want to get into the special here in uh, just a moment. There's so much stuff going on right yeah. now internationally, but let me start with something not that's not such a big deal. Mm. Let's ease into this thing. Yeah, the Eagles. Yeah, just yeah. losing. Uh, I mean, just uh, horrible. I mean. I'm not emotionally ready to deal with it. It's, it's I know, amazing. I know. I, it I know. really is fascinating how this stuff affects a human mm -hmm. being. But there at the game uh, was the first time at the Super Bowl we got the Black National Anthem. And this Please is don't call it that. Well, I'm going to call it that. It says right here on the story, Black National Anthem performance. It's actually called Lift Every Voice and Sing. It was called the Black National Anthem by the NAACP in the 19... It was actually called the Negro National Anthem in 1920. Um, and then... In the 60s, it was reintroduced again. Now it has been reintroduced a third time as a protest song. This song was written uh, 1899, written by James Johnson. He was a Republican uh, hmm. platform guy. Hmm. Um, and he was also a poet and a writer. So he wrote this for Abe Lincoln's hmm. birthday. Okay. Republican president. Republican president, mm -hmm. written by a Republican in honor of all the people that Abraham Lincoln uh, saved. Okay. It is, I think it's better than our national anthem. I love this song. As a song. As a song. I love it. But it's, it's insulting to black people. Just like if I said the Star Spangled Banner was the white national anthem. It's not. It's not. It's for Americans. This is not our national anthem. And it's an insult to say, to attach any color to a national anthem. You're saying that black people want their own country? This is something that has been discredited over and over and over again throughout our history. Yeah, it's because they're it's, Americans. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I think like conservatives hear black national anthem and think, they're trying to separate us. They're tr this is some woke they attempt. Are. And it is. However, the song itself the song is, is not that way. It, it, it's, I, it, it's a I, great story. I printed out the lyrics. Can I just read you the lyrics? Yeah. This, this is so I great. I preferred if you sang them. No. Okay. Lift, <laughs> I considered it. Lift every <laughs> voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. High as the listing skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full mm. of hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. That is fantastic. It, nowhere in here, is the protest, is the hate for America, is the lack of uh, God, is the grinding of the axe. Nowhere in this song. And yet it has been done such a grave disservice to make this now a protest song. It's Yeah, because I mean, it's kind of like, hey, we've had rough times, but yes. we have, have to have faith for the future, hope for the future. Stony the road we trod. Bitter the chastening rod. You can't even say chastening rod anymore. Mm. But how dare you? Felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. Uh, we have overcome, we have come over a way that, uh, that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the w white gleam of our bright star is cast. 
I mean, it's fantastic. Overcoming really bad things. Fantastic. But not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like, it's not, hey, America sucks and we should destroy it. No. It's, hey, we've had our problems, but we should have hope for the future. I would sing that as our national anthem, mm-hmm. if that was our national anthem. It's and not, we'd be proud right? of it. Yeah. Be proud of it. There's, when you hear, when conservatives hear black national anthem, you're right. They automatically think, oh, this is a protest. This is a, no, it's not. It was a victory song about overcoming darkness led by Abraham Lincoln. Now, without changing the words, mm. they twist it. Uh, Martin Luther King was against a black national anthem because he didn't think that we should have a black nation. We should bring everyone under the umbrella equally of America. They've, they've destroyed the meaning of this song. And I don't know if you went through the whole thing, but, but uh, the, I didn't hear the word black in it at all. There was no, no. reference to black people. To, well, was, no, but it was written, you know, yeah. about Abraham Lincoln freeing the slaves. Sure. But, I mean, it really could apply to anybody, I think, oh, yeah. who's, who struggles, right? That's yeah. why it's a national anthem. Right. If this was our, this, this is a solution to our problems. I mean, our problems are we all can't get over it. We all are whining about the past. We all think the past was, uh, was inflicted upon us. We're all blaming somebody else. You don't chasten me. You, who are you to say I'm wrong? All of that stuff. This sets it right. How did they co-opt mm. this as a protest song? I can see it as a celebratory black song, mm-hmm. okay? But as a... Uh, anti-American song? Where? It's not in there at all. Not in there at all. Um, let me switch gears with you. Um, to go over to, let's talk international. But we finally, hang on yeah. just a sec. But we finally found a white person that the left will excuse and pretend has nothing to do with it, just like Margaret Sanger. The writer of that <laughs> song <laughs> was the words, white guy. The music, white guy. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, fascinating. Two separate guys. Um, brothers. Brothers, right, yeah. Um, so let me go to uh, international affairs. Uh, Chinese spy balloon. We've got some. No, I thought we were going to talk about Fang Fang. Well, we international do- affairs. I thought, okay. Maybe. <laughs> uh, the balloon situation. We're shoot- now shooting down anything that comes anywhere near us, uh-huh. apparently. That's our new, our new strategy. Uh-huh. We, people inside don't seem to know anything about what's going on. It's not just us as citizens. It's people walking the halls in Washington don't even know what's going on. No, people that are supposed to know what's going on. I mean, I, I talked to uh, two people just on radio today, Mike Lee, Chris Stewart, both on the Intel Committee. Mm-hmm. Both had that meeting. Intel Committee is where you should be able to ask any questions and have access to all of the answers. They didn't even bring the footage from the, from the fighter jets. Now, that's the easiest thing to get. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, it was really blurry. I've seen that before. (laughs) I mean, I've watched, you know, on CNN, the the missiles go down chimneys. I've seen those before. I know what they look like. What do you mean you didn't bring any? So Mm -hmm. they have no answer on what it is. They've gone from don't rule out little green men to it's a weather balloon owned by a private company just yesterday. And everything in between. Um, this, it, it, the, the government is way out of control. And I think that um, we are headed for some real rocky times. The, the Russians just today, about 10 or 11 o'clock Eastern time, noon Eastern time, um, called for a... Uh, Security Council, UN Security Council meeting, an emergency Security Council meeting, and the topic is who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. This is fascinating because we had a report uh, from Seymour Hersh, who is an award-winning uh, journalist now writing at Substack. Mm-hmm. There's uh, two reports from him now. Yep, and he basically said the U.S. did this, and he's got sources, uh, that, and he has confirmed it. Now, there's lots of skepticism on his reporting. Uh, Seems to me like Russian propaganda. Right. Yeah, there is some. And it I mean, could be. Could be. Could be. Um, we don't know. We don't have the facts on it yet. But there is a lot of speculation, not just from people like Seymour Hersh, but people inside the intelligence community, people serving in, you know, in, in Congress, 
people are worried about this and want to get answers. And this is, seems to be a direct path. This is, a ga- ga- in case you don't know, gas pipeline from, running from Russia into Europe. Uh, this is something that if, if this were to be confirmed, I mean, you'd feel like almost like Russia would be justified. Would be justified in responding. Well, it was apparently us, Norway, the Swedes, I think. Finland, maybe. Finland. Um, And you understand from like Finland, they are spooked by the Soviet Union. Oh, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, spooked. Mm -hmm. Um, And so apparently we got it. This according to the latest from Seymour Hersh is we um, started hatching this plan and the Finns and, and everybody was involved, and then we didn't tell them the whole plan. We just went and did it. So they were involved, but we were the ones who did it, and we didn't really get a check with them. We didn't say, hey, by the way, I think we should blow this up. You know, I, I don't know how, long, uh, how far along uh, they were when the, when the Finns were cut off from the information. But even Biden, at the last minute, they were supposed to go down and blow it up. And at the last minute, Biden said, no, 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 rig it for detonation, but I want a trigger that we can drop a buoy down into the water and trigger it if we ever want to trigger it in the future. That's an act of war. That is also the way it was done could be construed as treason, actual treason. And we should point out they did wind up going ahead with it. I mean, they did. That was they, Somebody they did. talked about rigging it. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, this is the in the story. We don't know yeah. that the story is true, uh, but in the story, they w- initially went to rig it and then decided to go ahead with it anyway and, and actually blow the thing up. And you know, this is obviously high high stakes games. You're talking about World War III, potentially. You're talking about uh, an entire continent without access to heating. Uh, you know, in, in a cold winter. I mean, some of these problems have been solved as people have you know kind of scrambled to to solve them, but. Uh, Making a decision like this without any input from Congress, I mean... It's an act of war. It's not constitutional. Yeah, right. Right, and it's an act of war. Congress has to at least be informed. This isn't a response on something. Hey, we didn't have time. You planned this over a great deal of Mm. uh, time, and then you intentionally kept it from Congress and the oversight committees. Okay, they found this way around everything so they didn't have to go to Congress. And so a group of people who decided that, I don't know, oil from Russia was bad. Um, They were going to stop the independent. I mean, the 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 I guess the most charitable thing is like we're trying to free Europe. Now they're going to go through some cold months, but we're going to free them from this oppressor. Okay, that's the (sighs) best you can come up with. That was decided possibly by a small group of people in this administration mm. led by the president. That, I mean, this is what, this is deep state central. All right, so let me get you to speculate on something. Let's just say, let's take this for a fact for a second. The you know, Biden administration, small group of people working with a couple of group countries wound up blowing up this pipeline. Uh, it, that, let's just say that's true. Do you want the red pill or the blue pill? Do you want to know it? Do we want this to be public knowledge? Because if it is, it could swirl out of control very quickly and end us in World War III. Or do you want the blue pill? Hey, let's just not know this one particular thing. Maybe we'll all be safer. Well, the blue pill doesn't actually exist. Um, But you don't want to build this house any stronger uh, on this bed of corruption, mm. okay? The, the, the deep state can do this. You know, we said, if they did this to Donald Trump, what would they do to you? Look what they just did to our European allies, possibly, okay? Put them in a situation where people would freeze to death or starve to death. Uh, you don't want to be any part of that state. That has to be exposed. My hope is that there is a group, a bipartisan group, in Washington that loves the country enough that will get this information and then go to the UN Security Council, go to Russia, wherever, and say, look, we deserve some sort of a punishment here, but please let's not go to war. They're going to jail. 
Jeez, and that, doesn't that seem like what you're talking about is like a fairy tale? Doesn't that sound like a fairy tale when you just said it? The idea that people would come together in a bipartisan way to admit this wrong. Our very lives are at stake. This could go nuclear. Look, yeah. this could go to just, this could just go to an EMP or just an attack on our power grid. Mm. You put our power grid out, which is not hard to do. Millions of people could die. Millions just in America. Millions. You, I mean, you have 90% of the country die from an EMP attack. That's because the power is out. So just imagine, you know, they do it in a conventional way and they just hack into our power systems and they spin everything down for two months. America does not hold itself together mm. for two months. It doesn't make a week. Mm. <laughs> we're not very well prepared for pretty much anything at this point. Uh, Glenn Beck, uh, the new special is, yes, we're in a Cold War with China. We didn't even talk about a Cold War with China. Really. i got to tell you, this, though, this, we have their playbook that they actually wrote. Yeah. Um, and it shows how they are going to destroy America from within, without a tank. How are we going to destroy it from within? Stu, you won't believe it. Everything that's <laughs> in that, you're like... Yeah, that, that's one of our biggest problems right now. Yeah, that's happening. All of it's being done. Uh, all right. Well, check it out tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern, right after this program. As always, best way to watch is with your, only, uh, with your own Bla uh, Blaze TV subscription. Go to blazetv.com slash stew. Enter the promo code stew. Save 10 bucks. Glenn, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. All right, let me tell you about factor meal delivery and how it changed the way I eat. Basically the way that I, I could be honest with you, I mean, I do a, a junk food segment on this show pretty much every week. It, you know, I'm not the healthiest guy. I mean, look at me. You know what I'm saying? I, now, I want my kids to be healthy, and I know my wife always eats healthy. So how do you, how do you cook food for that group? It's, it's not, I mean, kids want kid food. Uh, you know, my wife wants healthy food. I want whatever the heck I eat. Factor, however, it gets you to kind of bring everybody together. You can skip the trip to the grocery store. You skip the chopping. You skip the prepping. You skip all the cleaning up. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So really, I mean, it's that easy. And I was using Factor before I started doing, uh, you know, talking to you about them here on the program. Uh, because they do all sorts of different ways to eat. You can order, um, you know, my wife sometimes will eat high-protein stuff. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm a vegetarian. My kids, they want to eat stuff that tastes good. They don't really care what it is. The bottom line is, if you go to factormeals.com slash American50, you can check this stuff out for yourself. I think you're really going to like it. It's really easy. The food is really good. If you want, like, delicious home-cooked meals at your house in the easiest way possible, go to factormeals.com slash America50. Use the code America50. You get 50% off your first box. It's uh, code America50 at factormeals.com slash America50. Get 50% off your first box now with the code America50. Time for one of our favorite uh, segments on the program. Biden's newest low. Yes, he's got a new low out there. Uh, just 12% of Democrats want Biden to be the party leader. Just 12%. That is embarrassing for a president that is in office. I mean, how does that even happen? Among, again, that's not among all Americans. That's among Democrats. Only 12% are like, yeah, that's the, that guy's the guy. Uh, it's a, it, if this guy gets reelected, it's going to be absolutely incredible. R legitimately incredible. He's like 115 years old. No one seems to like him. He's doing a terrible job. If, if he gets elected, it will be a giant gift from the Republican candidate, whoever that may be. We will see who that is as we go through the primary process over the next uh, year. Year. Year before we're actually voting on this. Wait until you see. We're going to go through all those debates. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be a tough year. It's going to be a tough year. You're going to be in utter pain. Pain like I'm in after the Eagles loss. That's, that's what the sort of pain you're going to be feeling for the next year. And I, I feel bad for you. I feel bad for you. I know I feel bad for me. And that's, of course, the most important thing. Diane Feinstein, by the way, I made a joke yesterday, and I felt a little bit bad about it afterward. I said, uh, Diane Feinstein, uh, you know, she announced that she was going to be retiring. And what must, must have really been surprising, imagine when she actually found out from her staff that that was true. And, you know, that was kind of a, a joke about how Diane Feinstein seems a little absent-minded these days, maybe not up to the uh, challenge of, of the mental acuity needed for her job. It was a joke yesterday. And then it wound up being completely true. Here is uh, the audio of an exchange with Dianne Feinstein. 
I haven't made that decision. I haven't released anything. It will be my plan. You put out the statement? I didn't know they put it out. Um, so it is what it is. I, I, this woman is an active senator. She retired. She was asked about it and had no idea they put out the statement. Now, to be fair to her staff, she surely did know that they put it out. She just forgot. She just forgot because she shouldn't be in office. It's an embarrassment to our country. Now, sure, she's still better than John Fetterman, but that's not the type of hurdle we should be proud that we're clearing in this country. Do you remember when $31.4 trillion seemed like a lot of money? Hmm. That's the debt ceiling. We already blew by that in January. They're saying now we have until between July and September, somewhere in there, to to avoid default. Uh, The leftist White House, of course, just continues to spend their way through it. That's what they're doing. So while our national leadership has buried their heads in the sand when it comes to fiscal responsibility, you can pull your head out and you can now diversify into gold with Birch Gold. In times of uncertainty and instability, gold is king. It's dependable. It's been around forever. Birch Gold makes it easy to convert an IRA or 401k into an IRA with precious metals. And all you have to do is text STU to 989898. You can claim your free info kit on gold and then talk to one of their precious metals specialists. Uh, You can do yourself a favor. You can do the country a favor. You can uh, get out of this, um, fight back against this mountain of debt that everyone has. You know, it's $247,000 per person now. It's only getting worse. Protect yourself now with gold. Go uh, Text them at 989898. Text the word STU to 989898. They get an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. Thousands of happy customers and countless five-star reviews. You can trust Birch Gold to protect your financial future. Get the information now. Text STU to 989898 today with Birch Gold. New poll is out on the Ukraine situation. And, the, you know, war is, is strange in this way. Like, usually when it starts, everybody supports it. And then that, that number deteriorates over time. We saw that with, you know, everything from Iraq to Afghanistan to Vietnam. Uh, and that was what happened in Vietnam, too. All these wars were very popular at the beginning. Same thing with Ukraine. People were very uh, gung-ho on getting involved. And there's different levels of that. But we're seeing a falling of these numbers now. Now only, uh, I think it's 48%. Um, of uh, Americans are saying they want to um, have a large role in, uh, in the war uh, when it comes to Ukraine. Not talking about being involved with ground troops or anything, but just big time support. Um, and Democrats remain more likely than Republicans to favor imposing economic sanctions on Russia, 75 to 60 percent, uh, respectively. Uh, accepting refugees from Ukraine, 73 to 42 percent, providing weapons to Ukraine, 63 to 39 percent. So 39 percent of Republicans still saying they want to help provide weapons and fund uh, government funds to Ukraine is 59 to 21 in that same poll. Bottom line is all of these numbers are down. Democrat side, independent side, Republican side, they're down significantly, not just from the beginning of the war, but just from a couple of uh, months ago. I know the the weapon support for the uh, for the U.S. among Republicans was 52 percent just, I think, in December. Now it's 39%. This stuff is falling away quickly. People don't have this attention span needed for this type of stuff. And they wonder whether they should be involved in something like this when World War III is the thing we're risking, not to mention all the economic costs. We'll be back in a second. Glenn Beck's big special coming up here on Blaze TV in just a second. You can support the network by going to blazetv.com slash stew. The promo code is stew. We do appreciate when you jump on board, and we'll see you tomorrow.